Hello, everyone. Uh, greetings to our friends who are uh, to the east, um, and good afternoon. Um, an extremely early good morning to our friends that are in the west. We are glad that you could join us today uh, and this week and next week for our anniversary, uh, our, our special edition of the WCBP 2021. Um, I was just mentioning to Julia, you know, what a year it's been. Can you imagine a year ago this week, we were in Washington, D.C., in the Mayflower blissfully enjoying the company of our friends and colleagues and uh, sharing stories and our little personal traditions that we've established over the years with each other. Uh, it truly is our, our, our professional family reunion. And little did we know a year ago that we were on the edge of a tsunami that was going to hit the entire world. And, you know, it's been, it's been a year of, of tragedy uh, for a lot of people, my family included, but it's also been a year of triumphs. Uh, particularly from the field of the profession that we are all in. Uh, and uh, I don't think that, as you'll see, we could have a more fitting um, recognition of the work that has been done by everyone in the, in the biologic sector, uh, whether it's been for vaccines or for therapeutics or for diagnostics in a variety of modalities than what we're going to be talking about this year. Um, Julia will give us a, a, a review of what transpired but I just want to say that that as the 25th anniversary year of WCBP, uh, there's probably nothing that we were more prepared for uh, and more more ready to meet the challenges of than than what we're going to hear about and and what lessons we can learn from it uh, if, that it could apply to all of biologics uh, from this point forward. With that, I'd like to just give you an overview of CAS. This is normally where I would be able to ask in person how many people this is their first CAS meeting. I uh, can't do that this year, but uh, we can certainly uh, still share the background of CAS and, and you'll see why I, I think that this, this year is uh, the culmination of, of two and a half decades of, of intense work uh, on the side of uh, CAS members. First, let's just go with the housekeeping things. If you have problems with your sound, please be sure your volume is turned up. There's a variety of connections between the platform and, and your ears that could be problematic. So please, please check with your system. If you are still having technical difficulties, um, please check with the information that was provided to you to run the digital uh, digital system checker um, to make sure that, that your actual connection to the world is okay. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, we're not in the Mayflower this year, and but we do uh, really strive to continue the networking, the connection building, the community building. Again and again, some of the most powerful aspects of an organization like CAS is that we get to know each other uh, and we get to, to learn from each other and exchange things with each other. So we've worked very, very hard. Uh, the CAS office has worked very hard to find platforms that allow us to do that. And you'll see some of that in the meeting this year, not only in the chat box, which is available for us streaming uh, as, we, as we continue the, each session, but also we have some novel uh, interactive, interactive formats in the terms of the Remo room and the networking sessions. As with every CAS meeting, half the value of the meeting is that we get into dialogue with each other. Um, we can't get up in the microphone. We can't walk to the center aisle as we would normally do at the Mayflower, but we do have the ability to pose questions. Uh, we have moderators for each session that are going to be um, sorting through the questions uh, and helping manage the answers, letting the speakers provide their answers. So I welcome you to please join the, the Q&A by posting your questions. We've got a lot of experience in that this year, and the facilitators for those sessions uh, will be uh, eagerly and actively engaged in moderating those questions. So if you don't already know, I'd like to just remind you what is CAS. Uh, well, if you're not from the United States, then you, you probably don't know what the name means. It's originally from California, um, but has now become a trademark of this organization. So CAS, it remains, even though we are, in fact, uh, quite global. Um, we're an agile nonprofit scientific organization. We are not political. We are not biased in any way. We, go, we, 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 follow, we follow the science. Um, we follow the, the, the regulatory guidance. We, fire, we follow the statutes that are uh, in, present in all of the regions in which we do our work. And our goal in CAS is that we all volunteer to bring together uh, the right professionals, whether they're from industry, whether they're from academia, whether they're in regulatory bodies, so that we can solve scientific and technical problems to help advance the development of biopharmaceuticals. And what we're gonna hear about this year represents the, 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 the pinnacle of that collaboration that CAS has been forever striving to develop. 
Um, two of my favorite quotations in the world, number one is, necessity is the mother of invention. And you will see, uh, and you certainly know personally, uh, what the needs have been this year uh, to allow us to, to try to leverage everything that we've learned in CAS over the last 25 years. The, my second is, chance favors those who are prepared. And all of the preparation that we've been doing for all other biologics uh, over the last three decades uh, are, were, were leveraged with the expertise that you'll see in the next uh, presentations the next two weeks. One thing that we do want to highlight with CAS, and I'm sure that there are many organizations that are in the same situation, is that we want to reiterate our, our, our commitment to inclusion, that, that we, we absolutely try to lower the energy barrier to be able to allow anyone from any region, from any organization to have an input uh, in the work that we do that's relevant to the development production of biological products. So you'll be seeing more of this in the next year that CAS actually, we're, we just had a retreat recently that, that we're redefining membership. What does membership 2030 mean? We have no membership dues. We're not a formal member organization, but we're, we're reflecting and trying to understand, especially with the, the silver lining that the pandemic has allowed us to leverage virtual platforms such as this, it means that geographical boundaries um, have disappeared for the ability to contribute and participate in and engage in some of the activities. It doesn't help with the time zones. As you can see, between the East and the West, we are straddling some time zones. We, we probably aren't going to be able to change the, the earth turning, but we have been able to, um, to leverage a lot of virtual capabilities, and we're looking at that and understanding how that can help us um, allow more people to become involved and have voices at the table for the development, the regulation, and the production of biological products. The reason for that is knowledge sharing. We actually depend a great deal upon shared knowledge from everyone in the field, whether it's someone who this is the first biological product they've ever used, or whether it's someone who was there for the first biologic ever licensed. So we, we want to be able to keep exchanging ideas. The advances that were made in the last two decades in production and the testing of biological products um, really came to bear in the talks that we're going to be talking about. We wouldn't have been able to do what was done this year had we not had a culture of knowledge sharing uh, that had been established and, and leveraged uh, across the world. We try to build a community. When we do surveys, we hear all the time, and I certainly am a living t testament to that, that, that CAS is a community of like-minded individuals for science and for regulation for these biological products. And that allows us to set aside, you know, potential differences that we have uh, and collaborate among all of us to be able to, to, to have success. Um, and we are very mindful of the fact that we're getting old. It's a reality that some of the people who established a recombinant field and certainly people that have been um, leaders in the vaccine and plasma field, you know, we, we are matriculating through our careers. And so we have a very strong eye toward making sure that we uh, recruit and we, we help develop and support the careers of everyone who's coming in, uh, who's going to continue the successes that we already have had. Um, in the community of biologics uh, and in CAS specifically. Our knowledge sharing events are, are many, although I will reiterate, uh, as I have been reiterating since, I, you know, since the last several years, CAS is not seeking to grow for growth's sake. We grow organically. We have in introduced new meetings, new topics as the field has dictated, as it has become important to share the knowledge, uh, to share the learnings. Um, one of the most recent uh, new additions that we had was cell and gene therapy a few years ago. And I, I've, I've mentioned this before, but I'll say it again, that I wasn't there at the very beginning where monoclonal antibodies were for recombinant monoclonal antibodies were first being developed. But uh, sitting there in the room at the cell and gene therapy forum, watching regulators from around the world, uh, scientific regulators and scientists in industry uh, and folks from academia who are developing these new technologies sit there and discuss what are the important elements of the production and the testing and the control of these very complex modalities and, and watching them work side by side, trying to figure out what are the best things to guide people in the development of CMC? What's the information we have to have about the process, about the product? What are some of the elements that we feel should be controlled? And I realized that watching this, it must have been like deja vu to see people who were doing this exact same thing 
25, 30 years ago for, for the, what we now know are monoclonal antibodies, which are rel relatively, um, I won't say common, but we have a lot of experience with them in the field to the point where we can develop biosimilar versions of them. But seeing this collaborative uh, interaction organically arise from this new product field um, was just spectacular. And it just reminded me that this must be what all of these are like. Um, and we actually are now uh, uh, spanning the globe with CMC forums because the information, although a lot of it may have originated in certain regions of the world, every region of the world needs our products. And every region of the world has very bright, um, dedicated individuals uh, who want to share their knowledge to be able to uh, have products developed and, and, and licensed globally. In that regard, we do encourage global access. As I said, it started in the West, it started in North America, but, but, but biologics is global and, and, uh, our, that ref, that's reflected in the people who participate in CAS. Um, and with the ability for us to do live streaming and for the ability for us to be able to reach people with virtual platforms, I have no doubt that our global access and global interactions are definitely going to continue to increase. The whole purpose of this is collaboration for capacity building. We want to have the best science and we want to have the best compliance. We want to have regulations that are, are, are controlling what we have to control. I mean, just based, just, just this year, this, this whole operation warp speed and the need to be able to develop and produce and distribute vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics is reminds us of what can happen when we're not when we don't have good control over our processes and our products. And most everybody who's involved in CAS, certainly if you've been involved in biologics for a while, you're very mindful of the cutter incident that occurred with polio vaccine, where slight changes or slight variances in a manufacturing process of a biologic or slight variances in the performance of an analytical method can lead to major problems with our with our types of products and, and that's what we learned from that's what the regulations are based on it's learning you know what is important to control for these products and so the idea that we're collaborating and that we want to be able to have high, highly meaningful guidances and regulatory uh, guidance on what we do for our products is vital because our products have are very sensitive to production and they're very sensitive in the analytics that we apply to them um, we also want to be sure that we have collaborations, not just academic uh, to industry, industry to regulatory, but peer to peer. So we actually have opportunities, and I'm sure we'll have more, to be able to have agency to agency discussions. We always have industry to industry discussions. But this allows us to get better alignment driven by data, driven by science, uh, and driven by experience that allows us to be able to um, make the right decisions and put in place the right guidances and share successes and share failures with each other so that we don't repeat the same mistakes. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Julia Edwards, uh, one of the organizers of the special edition 2021, uh, and she'll continue with the discussion. And thank you very much. I look forward to interacting with everyone. I will be in the networking sessions. I hope that you will be too. And I certainly hope that this time next year, we can share uh, hugs and drinks uh, once again at the Mayflower Hotel. So with that, stay safe, everyone, and uh, let's just be prepared to learn. Thanks, Julia. Thank you, Nadine. My name is Julia Edwards, and I'm this year's industry chair for this very special edition of WZBP, Creating Strategies for Pandemics and Beyond. As Nadine said, 2020 has been quite a year. In fact, I would say the first month of 2021 um, has also been quite extraordinary. Um, it's this sense of hope with starting a new year, the swearing in of a new president. My mother, who works as a nurse on the front line, has received both doses of her COVID vaccine. And there's a real sense of hope the sense of hope for what we can do as an industry and as humankind. And it's contrasted a bit with these challenges of 2020 that we had. Um, I had personal challenges, probably some that many of you can relate to. I taught my daughter seventh grade math in between minute uh, meetings. I had constant worry for my mother who continued to work as a nurse, not because she had to, but because she was called to. I grieved the loss of a grandfather who died alone in a nursing home. Our purpose 
as an industry dedicated to biopharmaceutical development and the urgency with which we must meet the needs of our patients is more important than ever before. So feeling the newness of 2021, the trials and tribulations of 2020, what comes to mind is resiliency. How I personally, how us as an industry have risen to meet an occasion of unprecedented circumstance. And the way we have risen and what we have achieved this year gives me incredible hope for our future. Planning this year's WCBP was a journey. And I have to say that this year's meeting is unlike any other that we have had in the past 25 years of this symposium. And our journey in planning this really highlights the resiliency and fortitude of what we can do when a scientific community comes together in collaboration and transparency to meet one of the greatest challenges of our time that we will experience as CMC professionals in drug development. I go back to a moment a year ago, and it's often those moments in time in a reflection of where things started or how things started for you. In this moment, it was a year ago at WCBP, I was the incoming industry chair. And as the industry chair for the next year, one of the most important things you do to start the planning cycle is to come up with a theme for the next year. During the course of meeting, you prepare slides, you have a pitch, I remember distinctly sparring ideas with Jamie Moore and Ken Miller in the bar at the Mayflower with a nice glass of wine. <clears throat> you worry about every word of that theme. What does it mean? What does it mean to the program? How will you adapt it? It was a big moment, a big moment for me after attending this meeting for 17 years, a moment to put my own personal spin, my own personal touch into what we are as a community. So four days, you agonize details, then you present the theme at a dinner on the very last night of WCBP. And you sit with folks like Bill Hancock and John Friends and Nate Dean and Margie Shapiro, Steffi Plushkel, Joe Kutza, and others. And you have some food and wine and you challenge each other in the great tradition of WCBP and CAS and discuss that theme. After four hours of discussion and I don't think that's an exaggeration. It was probably four hours. Of course, some food and wine was involved as well. But the theme we came to was pioneering disruptive change. That theme proved to be a lesson in being careful what you wish for. I was thinking disruption in the context of our industry really taking action and making change and taking risk. And well, we got more disruption than I could have ever imagined. So after about half a year of planning around that theme, it was July when we officially made a pivot to come to a virtual meeting geared towards pandemic related topics. The content, the planning, everything you're about to see came together in half the time that it usually does. And I have to say, the content, the panels you'll see, the innovation that's coming through, it's better than anything I could have imagined a year ago. I witnessed committees and the scientific organizing committee specifically coming together with passion and accountability, the dialogue and the sharing of challenges, both about life and work, challenging each other, asking hard questions. We had moments where we didn't know the answer. We didn't know the next step. And we met those with grace and patience and time. And we also had some fun. I believe my dogs barked through almost every meeting we had because it's the time of day the mailman comes. This is resiliency. This is how we disrupt. This is how we change and how we take risk. We didn't just plan this meeting around a theme, we live the theme of pioneering disruptive change. We have been disrupted. We have proven our resiliency and what we can achieve when we come together. We can take risks. 
we can make change and we don't need a pandemic as a call to action. This is who we are now and in our future. We're all here as academics, industry, regulators. We're here to pioneer, to learn, to change, to move this forward for the sake of a better future for our patients. So as we go through the next eight days or so, let's start imagining what the next 25 years of WCBP symposia will be, can be, and should be to meet the next great challenge. And as I said, this was an extraordinary year of planning. And I have to thank my co-chairs, Chris, Cassandra, were excellent to work with and so supportive in everything that we had to do to pivot this meeting. Ava and Ken and Joanna, the workshop co-chairs, um, did a fabulous job in putting all this content together. Kevin, um, on the roundtables, we have a fantastic panel of roundtables. Um, I really um, encourage you all to go and, and visit roundtables this year. It's not an easy thing to put together. And then Kim, um, we have her here as an innovation disruption chair, and um, she's also done a lot. We will be putting together a white paper at, as an outcome of this meeting, and Kim has really um, done a lot with pulling that together. The Scientific Organizing Committee, I can't think enough. The program, the content, the diversity of speakers and companies we have is truly amazing. And I can't thank these folks enough for everything they've done and the cast staff. Um, Karen, I am almost at a loss for words. And what, what we did, the planning of these two meetings, the pivot to virtual, this marathon that is eight days of meetings, Rose, Alyssa, Stephanie, Julie, Sol, Randy, Renee, Anne, Carolyn, and Catherine. We could not do this without incredibly dedicated and talented cast staff. So thank you. Also our strategic program partners, we could not do this meeting without you. Thank you for your continued support of our mission and vision and for WCBP. Our symposium program partners, again, we could not do this without you. Our exhibitors, um, our exhibitors, I'll talk a little bit more about our exhibitors, but central to WCBP and a big part of our tradition at this meeting. And then, of course, our media partners, Bioprocess International and IPQ. I always appreciate the coverage and um, the words coming out of these. So a little bit about our vendor experience. The exhibit hall is open both weeks. Please, please go visit the exhibitors. You can find the designated exhibitor times and links to the virtual exhibit hall and the session schedule. Exhibitors will host real-time screen-to-screen -screen interaction through the networking platforms as well. But don't forget, opt-in. Opt-in when entering a booth in the Remo platform. This allows exhibitors to know who they are communicating with and who is downloading their resources. So please, during the next eight days, next two weeks, please take time to visit our exhibitors. Also the roundtables. I'm very excited to be bringing this roundtable discussion into this format. Um, they'll take place via our networking platform and you can find topics and links in the session schedule. As you enter the session, you'll see a bird's eye floor of the floor with tables. It's, it's relatively straightforward and they're labeled and they are first come, first serve. So get in and get to your table, um, get that topic that you want, um, because there will be limited participation at each table. And when you go in, sit at the table, double click over to the seat you wish to fill and have a great discussion. A few other reminders, um, our virtual platform. So use all the features of the virtual platform, our chat, Q and A, access to speaker abstract and slides. There is an online searchable program. So this is a great resource to see who's speaking, when, and their abstracts. Networking, community building, this is what we're all about. Build your community. Um, chat is open now, and the networking platform will be open later today. 
Also, if you want to take some notes each session, um, you can take note taking directly in um, our platform. So that's also very convenient. So with that, thank you to each of you for being here. Thank you to everyone and the many, many folks who touched this meeting either directly or indirectly. It's a very special moment for us as a biopharmaceutical industry. And I'm so looking forward to the next two weeks. Thank you. Hello, good morning, everybody. It is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Barney Graham. Dr. Graham is deputy director of the NIAID Vaccine Research Center. He has a BA from Rice University an MD from the University of Kansas School of Medicine, and a PhD in microbiology and immunology from Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, where he also completed internal medicine residency, chief residency, and a fellowship in infectious diseases. His primary interests are vaccine development for viral diseases, viral pathogenesis, mechanisms of immunity, and pandemic preparedness. He directs basic laboratory research contributes to the pipeline of new VRC vaccines and provides oversight of candidate VRC vaccines and antibodies in advanced development, including those for HIV, HIV, Ebola, and chikungunya. His laboratory explores the structural basis for antibody-mediated viral neutralization, investigates basic mechanisms by which T cells affect viral clearance and immuno immunopathology, and has developed novel vaccines for RSV, influenza, Zika, and coronaviruses, including the first COVID-19 vaccine and monoclonal antibody to enter clinical testing, and have, which have now achieved emergency use authorization. So a warm welcome to Barney Graham. And just a note, um, Barney will be taking some questions after his talk. So please put your questions into um, the Q&A in the chat. So Barney, thank you very much for joining us and I'll turn it over to you. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's a great honor for me to address uh, people who've probably been even more stressed than me over this last year. So I uh, appreciate what the regulatory people and, um, and making these decisions under this pressure uh, must have been like. So it's my pleasure to be here with you. I'm going to talk about uh, the coronavirus vaccine development, but First, I want to talk about some of the ideas we've had about um, how to be better prepared for future pandemics. This really grows out uh, in part uh, from the Vaccine Research Center itself, which was founded in 2000 to develop an HIV vaccine. And uh, when you think about it, HIV really was a emerging infectious disease. And now it sort of has a life of its own, but this was a regional zoonosis that if it had been found and diagnosed and recognized early on, could have been maintained regionally. And part of the point I want to make is that if we can be better organized on a global level, that the zoonotic and vector-borne uh, problems that will arise and continue to arise as these have over these last several uh, years, uh, we could recognize them regionally and, and contain and control them regionally before they became pandemic problems. And in the past, I think it really, the viruses really have had uh, the advantage over us because they can adapt faster and, and have more mechanisms to adapt than, than we have ever had uh, with our approaches to uh, contact tracing and quarantine. But over time, uh, vaccine uh, development in particular has changed largely based on new uh, techno technological advances. And I'm just showing you a graph here plotting out the timeline of new vaccines as they were introduced. And this first cluster really came because of the efforts of a few uh, individuals. But this next big cluster came because of the discovery of cell culture and the the ability to grow virus in large quantities to either uh, make live attenuated uh, vaccines or whole inactivated vaccines. And the next group came largely because of advances in molecular biology and the ability to make uh, molecular clones or 
recombinant proteins or reassortant type of uh, products. And so this, um, this is where we were um, a few years ago, but around 2008 or nine or 10, uh, a whole new set of tools came on board, largely driven by uh, so far our unsuccessful efforts to make an HIV vaccine. And one of those includes structural biology that I'll spend some time talking about today. And we thought maybe that uh, the RSV vaccine might be uh, one of the first examples of a structure-based vaccine design that ended up having a clinical uh, relevance. But uh, this other uh, problem, the coronavirus slipped in and it may be that it will be the first vaccine uh, based on some of these newer technologies that not only include gene-based delivery, but uh, rapid synthesis and manufacturing and all these other techniques that allow you to really understand uh, uh, the antigenic target and the immune responses to that target in much more detail and, and with much more precision. So now I think that um, our technologies uh, maybe have the advantage over the viruses if we apply them. And I think we're in an era where I think we could apply them in a way that, that makes this uh, very uh, historically uncertain process of biological development uh, more of an engineering type exercise where we could do things in, um, in, uh, in ways that we could string together a set of uh, predictable uh, approaches that could result in a biological product driven largely by these technologies. And the technologies, fortunately, are not only things that can uh, make this approach more precise, uh, like I've listed here, the structure-based design and, and some of the new approaches to protein engineering of self-assembly nanoparticles, but uh, they can make it more rapid. And, and combining precision and speed is what we need to address emerging infectious diseases, uh, which many of which we've faced over this last decade. And so after going through the chikungunya and the MERS and the 2014 West African Ebola and then Zika in 2016, we started to step back and say, we really cannot keep doing this, uh, doing it in this way forever. And we have to take a more proactive approach. And there have been some uh, interesting papers published by Woolhouse uh, from the UK about the number of accumulating new emerging viruses found in humans, but that the number of viral families involved had sort of leveled off. And so there really is, now that they've re renamed the uh, Bunya viruses, about 26 viral families that are known to infect humans. And I'm listing some of them here. Uh, these viral families infect humans. For, for some of these, we already have uh, candidate uh, vaccines in humans. and But there are a number of other viral um, uh, family members behind these uh, that really don't have um, ready solutions. There's a number of virus families where we still don't have a licensed vaccine. I guess I need to move uh, filoviruses now, but uh, there's a number of other virus families adding up to about 26. And if you add arteriviruses, which I worry a bit about that have not been yet in humans, uh, maybe 27. But there are a number of viral families, but it's limited. It's a, a, a tractable problem. It's a finite problem. And, and so if we could uh, address these about 120 known viruses uh, known to infect humans, uh, and then as in particular focus on at least 30 prototypes within those, and take those, uh, uh, learn the details of the structures and make a monoclonal antibody reagents, understand replication pathways. And I'm going to be talking mostly about vaccines, but this could also be applied to antivirals and other types of uh, countermeasures. That we could uh, establish what I call a prototype pathogen approach to pandemic preparedness and have some things, uh, for instance, maybe on the shelf for these 30 uh, prototypes, but have other 
uh, reagents and potential products, at least through animal testing for these other 120 known viruses. And uh, in the past, these have been categorized uh, as in priorities, but we really think it's important to try to address this in a more systematic way and do all the virus families and subfamilies or genuses that might be clustered as a similar pathogen. And so we've envisioned this as a, um, as a uh, division of labor, labor between the pathogen specialist who would maybe specialize in an, an area of envelope viruses with class one fusion proteins or viruses with this other entry mechanism, class two fusion proteins or, or another fusion protein entry mechanism or non-envelope viruses and, and divide these into four major areas of entry mechanisms for viruses that could be studied in detail by groups of people with pathogen specific uh, knowledge. And these could be supported by systems and groups and hopefully self-standing buildings uh, that could perform these core functions more uh, related to uh, development uh, to combine the research spe specific for the pathogen and the development with these other uh, functions that could be more uh, uh, core functions. And so uh, this is partly how the VRC has been organized. And I'll just briefly introduce you to the Vaccine Research Center where I work. It was founded in 2000, uh, announced in 1998 by Bill Clinton at Morgan State University and established to develop an HIV vaccine. And as I mentioned, even though we don't have an HIV vaccine, these technologies that have been uh, developed to try to make an HIV vaccine have been applied to a number of unmet medical needs and other emerging infectious diseases because not only do we have a basic research facility, but we also have uh, process development, a uh, number of engineers that are expert in this uh, arena, uh, another group of engineers who do uh, G GMP manufacturing at a pilot level uh, scale in Frederick, we have our own self-contained uh, clinic to test these products and a laboratory that focuses on analysis of these clinical uh, trial uh, samples. It's run by this uh, relatively small group of investigators and program heads and led by John Moscola, pictured here. Over the years, we have done uh, uh, and delivered vaccines by a number of different approaches, including nucleic acids, which I'll talk more about, vector-based approaches using viral vectors, uh, one-round vectors, virus-like particles, proteins, and nanoparticles, I'll mention briefly, and monoclonal antibodies. And these products, experimental products, have been shared uh, around the world uh, for different types of diseases. And uh, as an example, recently, uh, one of those, the antibody, what we call MAB114, was uh, granted approval. This is our first approved product from the VRC. It's uh, now called Ibanga. It's an antibody that was shown in 2018 to prevent or treat, to treat uh, people with Ebola and, and, uh, and was shown to be efficacious uh, at, a, at a pretty high level. So that, that is an example of what the VRC has done to apply the technologies uh, started through HIV research. So uh, making these things, as we've learned, is, is not enough unless you can go fast. And uh, we had a vaccine in the vial ready for a phase one trial uh, in 2014 when the Ebola, West African Ebola problem emerged uh, and took the world uh, sort of by surprise. And despite our best efforts in getting this into a phase three trial within a year, uh, since we had chosen Liberia, by the time that phase three trial was able to start, the ep epidemic had waned and we did not get an answer. If you cannot get an answer about efficacy in the middle of a, an outbreak, uh, then it makes it very hard to invest in these products for the future if you cannot get answers about efficacy in the field. So we needed to go faster and we 
tried to go faster in 2016 when we started working at the end of 2015 on a Zika vaccine based on a DNA approach. And again, uh, we were able to get into phase three. Uh, we got into phase one in a little over 100 days, but phase three or phase two B efficacy uh, in a little over a year. But again, we missed the outbreak and were not able to get a, a final answer. So thinking about how to uh, do this in a faster way, looking at uh, platform manufacturing approaches like the mRNA that we'll talk about in a few minutes where you can insert an antigen of choice and and uh, but use the same manufacturing process, purification process, and uh, release criteria to to more rapidly produce a, a clinical grade product and doing more work on prioritization of pathogens, but again, trying to uh, do this in a systematic way, embracing all the 26 virus families uh, of interest. Our, work, our, our thoughts started changing uh, uh, in part um, back in 2013 when we were able to capture this uh, structure of the F glycoprotein of RSV uh, in its pre-fusion confirmation. Historically, this uh, virus had, had evaded uh, any kind of effort at vaccine development, and, and uh, the F protein had been used many times as a vaccine antigen, but it, it turns out that it was always uh, used in this form. And, and so when we found this pre-fusion uh, form of the F, uh, as it sits on the viral membrane, at the apex, uh, it has a neutralization sensitive epitope to which antibodies are typically uh, up to 100 times more potent than the one to the licensed uh, monoclonal antibody, palivizumab, uh, that binds more uh, down here. And so finding this neutralization sensitive epitope, uh, we wanted to uh, uh, test as a, a vaccine concept because Typically, as I mentioned, even in a, a spontaneous way without any uh, cell receptor, uh, this protein has a tendency to rearrange into the post-fusion molecule, and these apical epitopes are lost when that happens. And this is the molecule used in these prior vaccine trials, at least in five different episodes, and only able to boost responses uh, by about two to three-fold. But learning how to stabilize this with a C-terminal trimerization domain and internal disulfides and cavity filling mutations uh, and holding this in its pre-fusion confirmation, we were able to show that this now could boost with a single injection, even without adjuvant, uh, over 16-fold neutralizing activity, uh, which made it a much better vaccine candidate. And just to clarify how this happens and why the confirmation is so important, I'm showing you a cartoon here created at the Rocky Mountain Labs. And uh, you have to target the protein in its original native pre-fusion confirmation uh, shown here because this dramatic rearrangement in which it grabs the host cell membrane, pulls it together so that viral genome can enter results in a protein that uh, just has a dramatically different set of surfaces and a set of different B-cell or antibody targets. And these class one fusion proteins are, are common to many of the envelope viruses that we care about making vaccines to, uh, influenza, HIV, Ebola, Lassa. But these three in particular, we focused on not only RSV, but some parainfluenza viruses or paramyxoviruses and, and now coronavirus. And the thing that makes these uh, similar is that even though there's functional homology, but uh, there may be different domain structures like you see in coronavirus that are different than these, but they have uh, shared motifs and this functional homology and all have these internal cleavage sites that exposes a hydrophobic fusion peptide that allows these heptad repeats then uh, to pull the cell membrane that's pierced by the fusion peptide together to the viral membrane that's anchored in this transmembrane region. 
And so all of these proteins work in a similar fashion and maintaining that original prefusion confirmation turns out to be important. So uh, we've done studies with uh, paramyxoviruses, uh, including uh, Nipah as a prototype, and, but also mumps and measles as new uh, uh, potential approaches for those pathogens. And paramyxoviruses uh, have not only a fusion protein, but also an attachment protein that can be given different names. Uh, sometimes it has hemagglutination activity, sometimes not. But these fusion proteins work just like I just showed you with RSV. Um, and uh, the attachment proteins uh, are often uh, tetrameric or dimer of dimer type structures and, uh, and sometimes determine viral tropism. So we made, uh, we, first we showed that these prefusion F molecules stabilized are much more immunogenic than, than the native wild type F or the uh, certainly better than the post-fusion F. We designed uh, uh, vaccine antigens based on either pre-F or hexameric G. Uh, in some cases, the G is a better target. In some cases, the F is a better target. So we also made uh, these chimeric molecules in which uh, the pre-F can be connected through a fold-on domain, trimerization domain, to uh, the attachment protein. And we've learned now that this can be made either as a protein or delivered as an mRNA and effectively uh, prevent uh, things like NEPA virus, which we've tested now in, in ferrets. We also applied this to coronavirus because about the same time we were finding the RSV uh, F uh, confirmation to be so important, MERS coronavirus uh, emerged in the Middle East and uh, and it was the second major beta coronavirus to emerge over those 10 years since the first SARS in 2002 and, and three. And so since there was no structural information yet on uh, the spike protein of coronavirus, we started a program there. And, uh, and uh, I'll tell you about that in just a minute, but we have uh, endemic coronaviruses, either beta coronaviruses or two alpha coronaviruses that circulate uh, every year and that have entered the human population over the last several hundred years. And, and now we've had these two new coronaviruses uh, over a 10-year span, and we expected uh, this could be a problem in the future. So the program was in part to demonstrate uh, that the stabilization of the pre-fusion form of the spike would be a better vaccine antigen and a different envelope virus but in part because uh, uh, coronaviruses looked like they were something that could, could reemerge. And so uh, failing on the MERS and the SARS uh, structure, uh, initially we turned to uh, HKU1 and one of the endemic beta coronaviruses in collaboration with Jason McClellan, who's also been a long-term collaborator on the RSV work and other uh, structural work and Andrew Ward, who had cryo-electron microscopy at Scripps, we were able to get the structure of the spike uh, of the HKU1 virus and turned out to be a very interesting molecule and different than other class one fusion proteins we'd found. It, it not only does the rearrangement for uh, membrane fusion, but it has these other very interesting dynamic properties in which the receptor binding domain is woven around the adjacent protomer, and it has to come up in order to meet its receptor. And in this case, for the SARS coronavirus, it's uh, ACE2. And, and so without that RVD coming up, it, it cannot interact with ACE2. And once all three of these come up, we think it opens the S1, the top part, comes open and falls off of the S2, which is down here. And that is the fusion machinery that then uh, determines how the virus gets into the cell. And I don't know if you can appreciate this, these subtle movements, but the N-terminal domain shown in blue and some of these subdomains down here in gray, you see that they have to move. Some of these elements have to move in order for this RBD to come up. So there's all sorts of uh, subtle changes and mutations that can either make this come up or down easier. 
Some of those like the 614G that makes this in the up position more often may make the virus uh, maybe a little bit more uh, successful on infection. Others uh, like the 501 uh, mutation at the tip here might make it have higher affinity as a, to be more successful on infection. Some of these mutations facilitate entry. It turns out that uh, we found that uh, adding two prolines to the top of the central helix uh, to prevent stacking of this heptad repeat uh, was able to stabilize this molecule and its pre-fusion conformation and preserve these neutralization sensitive epitopes at the apex. And, and it turned out that those same two um, prolines in the analogous position uh, were, were able to stabilize MERS and SARS and a number of other uh, coronaviruses. And not only did it uh, stabilize the structure, but it looked like it increased overall expression of the pro of the protein from transduced cells. And so in the case of MERS, the wild type, uh, uh, the S2P, the two proline mutation had expressed at a 50 times greater level than the wild type protein, which means it could also create an advantage for gene-based uh, delivery approaches. And uh, as I mentioned, it, it was able to stabilize many other viruses. So we were able to get the structure of the MERS spike and the SARS spike and uh, other endemic coronavirus spikes, even an alpha, virus, an alpha coronavirus, veterinary coronaviruses, even uh, pre-emergent uh, bat-derived coronavirus spikes could be stabilized with this same two-proline uh, mutation. So we had a lot of confidence that that could be a generalizable approach for beta coronavirus uh, spike antigen design. And so uh, after our experience with uh, Moderna during 2016 and Zika, seeing how potent their mRNA delivery uh, approach could be for, for vaccine antigens, we uh, started a collaboration with them on both paramyxoviruses and coronaviruses to explore um, uh, whether uh, the prototype approach could be applied and just to demonstrate that it was feasible. And so using NEPA as the prototype for Baramixo and MERS coronavirus as the par uh, prototype for uh, Corona, we uh, had them make mRNA uh, de delivery uh, vectors that we tested in mice. And you see in coronavirus, a 0.1 or one microgram dose, two doses in mice were able to protect against uh, uh, infection with the MERS coronavirus in these human DPP4 transgenic mice from Ralph Barrick. Uh, they prevented virus replication in lung. They prevented uh, disease expression measured by a hemorrhage score. And they prevented weight loss. And even in the dose that where there was breakthrough at the 0.01 microgram dose level, uh, where you did even get some evidence of uh, disease, it uh, it had uh, the partial immunity led to partial protection. It didn't lead to any kind of disease enhancement. So we thought the mRNA approach and its uh, basic T cell um, pattern of induction was going to be a safe approach for uh, delivery, even in a, in a case of a breakthrough infection. And then um, uh, as everyone knows, at the end of uh, 2019, this, uh, new uh, outbreak was reported and it turned out to be a beta coronavirus. We learned that around the 6th or 7th of January. And uh, we were, had been planning to start the uh, Nipah virus vaccine antigen in a phase one clinical trial with a Moderna mRNA. But uh, on the 7th, we decided to flip the, the uh, demonstration project back to coronaviruses. And so we waited for the sequence to emerge and and uh, applied it uh, to this new SARS-2. And uh, there's several reasons to go fast. At the time that happened, there was only a few dozen cases. So we didn't really know if it was gonna be a problem or not globally, but we wanted to do it as a demonstration of this pandemic preparedness approach. And since then we've learned it really is a problem. And I'm just showing you um, representation of some of the great deadliest plagues pandemics in history. And, and many of these were caused by Yersinia pestis. And 
the Black Death in the 14th century and other uh, plague events were very large uh, and deadly pandemics. There have been a couple uh, from other viruses like smallpox that have killed millions and millions of people or HIV, which over the last 40 years has killed upwards of uh, 35 to 40 million people. These others are respiratory viruses like uh, influenza uh, or now coronavirus. And among those, aside from the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic, which killed maybe 50 million people on Earth, these other uh, pandemic events like the Asian flu in the 50s or the Hong Kong flu in, in the 60s, uh, coronavirus has already killed more people uh, than these other pandemic threats in modern times. Over 2 million people on Earth have now died from in this coronavirus uh, pandemic over the last year. So there is a reason to have urgency about this uh, uh, problem and to, to try to speed vaccine delivery. And we also see a, a changing uh, pattern where the coronavirus not only is infecting in spring and summer, which is a bit unusual, but now it's even reached a more a steeper increase in its exponential spread through the population as it's going through these winter months. So we um, uh, started this as a demonstration project, but it obviously became a much more serious uh, development effort. Now I just wanna point out some things about the coronavirus. Uh, this is an airway epithelial cell, a ciliated airway epithelial cell that has been infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And this is an image that was captured by people at UNC uh, associated with Ralph Barrick. And these viruses coming out of this ciliated cell uh, can be seen here in greater detail. And if you look at it more closely, these are about 80 nanometer spherical objects with these large protrusions, about maybe 20 to the 24 spike proteins uh, per particle. So the spike protein has become the major target for vaccine development. It is the major mechanism for entry of viruses. It's the one that's most exposed on the surface of the virus. So in this um, amazing global response uh, that has included well over 200 different vaccine efforts, uh, more than 173 in preclinical evaluation, and now uh, probably more than 64 in clinical evaluation, most of these have focused on spike as the primary uh, antigenic target. Many of these have already achieved uh, status in phase three or, or large efficacy trials. As you know, nucleic acid approaches, recombinant vector approaches, and recombinant subunit, uh, subunit protein approaches. And many people have been uh, concerned about the speed at which this has gone and, and the level of uh, confidence has been uh, low in some, especially in some communities. So uh, it's been important for us to try to explain why this has been able to go uh, as fast as it has, partly because of the history of work that had already been done, but partly because uh, of these new technologies. And so uh, applying all of these, uh, either uh, all the pre-existing public-private relationships that had existed, the prior experience with responding to pandemics uh, made a difference. These new technologies to rapidly manufacture, the thinking and planning behind prototype pathogen approaches, uh, this idea of structure-based design, uh, rapid human monoclonal antibody discovery, and and even the old work on vaccine-enhanced disease from RSV all uh, were in place and able to be applied almost immediately to this new virus. So there was a prior work. It hasn't just been a one-year effort. Uh, but it has gone fast, and uh, these, pre, uh, these earlier efforts informed all of this because when the uh, sequences came uh, on the night of January 10th, we were able to order the sequences uh, on the 11th, Saturday morning, to 
order things we needed to make protein for structures, for assays, for uh, probes to search for new B cells uh, and new monoclonal antibodies, uh, to design vaccines, and even to design uh, assays for uh, making pseudoviruses for neutralization. So all of that could be ordered immediately. And on uh, the 14th of January, Moderna started manufacturing uh, at risk a GMP a clinical grade product to start a, a phase one clinical trial within 65 days. And in the meantime, we were able to make the protein. Uh, Jason McClellan solved this structure with Daniel Rapp at UT Austin. And with, in, with our collaboration, we made lice assays and, and confirmed immunogenicity in animals, all of which happened before this phase one trial started. And then phase three started within about six and a half months. Likewise, because we had already had a collaboration with Abcellera for looking for cross-reactive coronavirus antibodies, uh, we gave them the new probe and we gave them PBMCs. And within just a few weeks, we had a number of candidate antibodies that were picked up by Lilly and uh, improved and who rapidly manufactured and took these into trials and, and their phase three trial I was able to start within uh, about five months. And you just heard in the last few days, not only has it worked uh, to pr prevent uh, progression to hospitalization and people with modest, moderate to uh, mild uh, symptomatic coronavirus, but it, it also looks like it's uh, going to work effectively as a preventive uh, prophylactic uh, passive immun immunization. So we think everything starts with the, uh, the protein and knowing that it's in the right confirmation gave us a lot of uh, confidence. Um, we were able to see the confirmation, the initial confirmation from Jason around the 31st of January. And that gave us confidence to make these diagnostic assays like we did with CDC or discover these monoclonal antibodies or start a vaccine development program with Moderna. Uh, that at the time was a, a small to medium sized biotech uh, who could who had learned how to make uh, stable mRNA uh, delivery uh, vectors. And since then, a number of other groups uh, have achieved, uh, have gotten into advanced phase testing and, and many of them have used this stabilized version of the spike that we think is makes a better vaccine antigen including uh, the Pfizer BioNTech mRNA, the Janssen uh, ad vector, or the Novavax, and, and uh, eventually Sanofi uh, recombinant subunit proteins. All are going to have these spikes stabilized in the prefusion structure that we think makes a better antigen. And so uh, again, combining what we see is the rapid manufacturing and delivery approach that's also a very uh, simple and elemental approach, this maybe the simplest approach of all to make protein, in which you just uh, deliver mRNA as a single-stranded mRNA into the cell in this lipid nanoparticle. It's then made as a protein in, in the case of Moderna and and uh, Pfizer and BioNTech, it's, it's a membrane anchored protein that sits as a stabilized trimer on the cell surface. It elicits an antibody response. And uh, in this case, it was based on our, uh, the work on this path prototype pathogen preparedness and these technologies uh, that have been developed over these last uh, 10 or 20 years. One of the advantages of this type of RNA that both Moderna and Pfizer are using is that it is, um, it's designed with a modified nucleotide. So it's a one methyl uridine instead of an A-methylated uridine that is used to make the mRNA. And that helps it avoid some of these singling uh, pathways that all lead to uh, type one interferon uh, induction and, and, and effector functions. And so, uh, being careful to eliminate the double-stranded RNA or byproducts of the manufacturing and, and being careful to use, manufacture with this one methyl modified uh, nucleotide 
you can avoid uh, signaling largely through the TLR7, TLR3, or these RIGI MDA5 uh, pathways uh, and avoid a lot of uh, the uh, type 1 interferon that could maybe more rapidly clear the transduced cell and, and, and reduce the amount of uh, protein expression. There are other ways to deliver RNA that either with, uh, unmod with uh, the unmodified nucleotides or even in an amplicon uh, that comes from alpha viruses that can increase or amplify the message and produce a lot of protein rapidly. So this is just the one way of delivering the mRNA. But in this case, we've tested uh, for immunogenicity in mice and monkeys and humans, and, and all the cases have shown that the responses either equal or are at the upper end or exceed those in convalescent sera. Even in the humans, when you look at the neutralizing activity uh, after the second dose, uh, these responses uh, exceed those in, at the median of the convalescent human sera, even including people with uh, severe disease. We've been able to show protection in mice and monkeys in both the lower and the upper airway. And uh, also in terms of safety, uh, trying to avoid some of the pitfalls of the original whole inactivated virus RSV program in the 60s that led to the enhanced disease. Uh, these uh, approaches, mRNA approaches in particular, uh, create a very Th1 biased uh, T cell response. And these have uh, been surprisingly immunogenic, even in the elderly, both in the 50, 60, 70, and either even greater than 70 year old age groups uh, compared to the responses in the young adults uh, shown here. And, and the T cell responses were equally uh, biased toward the Th1 responses in, in these subjects. And we now have data that goes out to day 209, about six months after uh, the second dose. But in this case, uh, uh, this data showing both uh, ELISA responses and pseudovirus neutralization and two different types of live virus neutralization just shows that after the second dose a peak of response that uh, antibody responses are maintained relatively well through day 119, uh, giving us some encouragement that this, uh, the durability of protection may be uh, able to last at least through uh, a season. And, and as you know, we have to wait uh, to see what happens next year. So the phase three trial started in uh, July 27th, both for Pfizer and for Moderna. And, um, in early November, we learned from the interim analysis that uh, it looks like even after the first dose, some level of protection was achieved because this line of cumulative infections, uh, symptomatic coronavirus infections, is separating from uh, the placebo line, is separating from the vaccine or mRNA line. And the second dose came in around day 29. And uh, as, as you all know, uh, as well as I do, that this was highly effective in the 94, 95% range. And against severe disease, um, it was uh, all 30 cases of severe disease, which meant low uh, uh, oxygen level below 93 O2 sat and uh, or uh, hospitalization, all of those severe cases were in uh, the placebo recipients. And so uh, the VRPAC meant, I th think, on the uh, December 17th uh, for the Moderna product, a week earlier for that on the Pfizer product, and and we and then the FDA approved this, authorized it at least for emergency use uh, the next day on the 18th, and of course, Dr. Fauci, uh, who everybody uh, follows, uh, was immunized just a few days later. And now many of our, my staff members and friends and uh, colleagues have been uh, immunized. Um, Dr. Neusel uh, was one of the co-leaders of the uh, coronavirus prevention group that did has done a lot of these phase three trials. Uh, uh, this, these are some of our nurses, uh, this young student is one of the ones who made the initial batch of protein, 
Olu Abiona. Izmiki Corbett is a fellow in my lab who has led a lot of this work from, from the early days uh, and, and even before this outbreak started. And John Mascola is our uh, BRC director. So I wanna emphasize that this uh, rapid response was based largely on prior fundamental basic and translational research that uh, gave us tools for both precision and speed. And also because these uh, public-private partnerships had been already established in, uh, for at least three years before this event happened. And, and uh, we ended up with a good result, even better than we had hoped. And, uh, and so with these new technologies, I want to emphasize that I think prototype pathogen preparedness is feasible even for the other viral families that uh, remain out there. And so I want to thank uh, the people, the PIs and program heads I work with every day, Jason McClellan, who's been an important collaborator on all the structural work, uh, the very talented graphic artists at Rocky Mountain Labs who helped uh, make that uh, movie of the fusion process, and my lab, especially Dr. Corbett, who's hiding here, uh, who helped in, uh, in this coronavirus uh, pro program over these last five or six years. Of course, Moderna, our close academic collaborators, uh, not only at UT Austin with Jason, but at Vanderbilt with Mark Dennison and USNC with Ralph Barrick. And all of these groups, especially uh, the extramural division of microbiology and immunology at NIAD, who took on the IND for the phase one trial and, and helped get that done through their um, uh, network of uh, clinical sites. So I will stop there and uh, take any questions. I think we still have a few minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Graham. Um, so it's wonderful to have you here and just seeing that presentation, it just gives me goosebumps to see the science. And um, so great to have you here. We do have a few questions, several questions actually that have come through while you're talking. Um, and they've been upvoted and um, I, it's kind of an interesting thing um, in this virtual setting. So I'll just start with some of our most uh, popular questions here. Um, this one is from Francis. What were the main barriers to going faster in the clinical trials during the 2014 and 2016 outbreaks? For example, was it product development, manufacturing and scale up or regulatory? Well, I have to say that uh, the regulatory people have been working closely with the scientists all the way through this process. It's been uh, quite a remarkable thing. I, I would say the greatest barriers have been our own conventional thinking about how this should happen. And uh, even in the beginning uh, at the phase one trial, I think we could have started two weeks earlier but people just weren't used to uh, moving quite that fast. And at that time, the uh, outbreak had not really spread globally much. And so uh, I think uh, the thing that prevents us from going faster is mostly our own way of thinking about how it should be done. I, I really think a lot of this could always go faster. The, the other thing that allowed this to go faster than what typically happens, you know, with the RSV program, for instance, where that we think uh, is also uh, going to be effective. Uh, we're, we're, we just, it took us three years to get into a phase one trial and we're just now in the phase three and we won't have those results for a couple more years. So that's a more typical approach. The thing that made this feasible to compress all the animal studies and the uh, clinical timelines uh, was the influx of cash the ability for the companies to make decisions that were uh, all in parallel and not sequentially is what allowed them to go fast. And uh, I think that's, that is usually the major barrier typically to going fast is that you don't want to put the money at risk. So you do things serially. In this case, a lot of time and effort and money was put at risk, but I don't think any of the safety steps have been, have been skipped here. Thank you. Do you think what we learned with conventional thinking and 
parallel pathing is here to stay? Will that be with us for the future to meet the next big challenge that comes our way? Do you think we've gone that far in this? Well, I, I hope that it's at least changed uh, some of the paradigms and ways of thinking about what's possible. I, you know, I, I don't think we'll always be faced with this kind of a crisis, and I don't think there will always be billions of dollars uh, provided, uh, you know, ahead of time at risk, not knowing whether any of these things would work. And so I don't know that it will be conventional to go this fast, but at least we know that it's possible now to go this fast. And there's a little bit of a template for how to do it. But I think uh, under normal circumstances, uh, it's unlikely to go this fast in the near future. Yeah, thank you. I always wish we could go faster in drug development, no matter what. So, um, yes. yeah, an interesting perspective. So we have another question here from Ferrelli. Is mRNA technology going to become the go-to approach for viral vaccine development? I've always thought nucleic acids were the most elegant way to deliver a vaccine, you know, and we worked with DNA vaccines for 30 years and mRNA has only been really, uh, has only been figured out how to stabilize it and deliver it uh, effectively in the last five or 10 years. But nucleic acid delivery approaches are, in my way of thinking, the most elemental way of getting a protein made as a vaccine. It, it, it creates a platform technology that doesn't require a lot of modifications and it allows the cells to make it uh, themselves. It creates not only the protein for an antibody response, but it induces everything we need to make T cell responses, both CD4 and CD8 T cell responses. So I think it's a very effective way of delivering a protein. And in some cases, it may be the right way to deliver a vaccine uh, antigen. In this case, I think it was in I think for some of the flaviviruses like Zika, if you can produce uh, subviral particles, that it may be a good approach for that. I don't know yet whether it's the best way to boost. If you have pre-existing immune responses that, to things like we do for RSV and flu, I don't know if it's better to boost yet with a nucleic acid or a protein. Proteins are a very good way to boost responses and so I think all of these different technologies have their place. And I think we have to figure out uh, how they're fit for the purpose that they're intended to, to, to be. So, but mRNA clearly is feasible. Now we know how to scale it up. And, and so I think it's gonna be one of the important tools going forward. Thank you for that. Okay, the next question. Sorry for this, let me, I'm still working, figuring out how to work this uh, virtual platform. Um, let me just switch over here uh, to my computer. So this question is from Mark. What is NIAID going to address vaccine hesitancy in the general population? Well, I think a number of us uh, are very devoted to that. Um, I think uh, Dr. Corbett, Kizmikia Corbett and I are on webinars. Uh, if we add them up uh, almost every night of the week, trying to help inform people about what this process is like and how it works. And Dr. Fauci, Dr. Collins, uh, many people at NIH, uh, Dr. Moscola, my director, uh, are all very invested in uh, community education. And, and maybe we have an opportunity uh, during this crisis that all of us are experiencing together to, to make changes in the way people think about vaccines in general and, and the way they might trust. We may be able to gain a little bit of trust back in the federal government and uh, you know, with the biomedical research enterprise, and, and hopefully we can turn that needle back a little bit more toward the trust. So I'm, I'm, there's a lot of effort being put into this. The 
the network groups also have a large community education effort, not only for uh, bringing people into the trials, but to help them understand uh, about whether the vaccines, uh, how they were made and how they can be trusted. So the goal is to help people uh, be better informed so they can make their own decisions. Some people may still decide not to get a vaccine, but I think, you know, the choice people have to make, in my opinion, is uh, you either, everybody's going to be immune in a few years, and you're either going to get that way by infection or by vaccination. And the infection gives you a one or two percent chance of dying. And the immunization is giving you a couple of chances out of a million to have an allergic reaction. And so I, I think people have to decide which one is the safest. Yeah. Okay. okay. A question from Sharon. Do we understand why we don't have an HIV vaccine? Well, I can tell you a lot of reasons why we don't have an HIV vaccine, and they're all involved biology. And uh, that virus uh, has so many ways of immune evasion, uh, even just based on the antibody responses. It can do the conformational evasion that RSV does. It can do the antigenic uh, variability and immunodominance uh, misdirection that influenza does. And it can have this extensive glycan shield and uh, hide all of its important epitopes in some ways like coronavirus does, which is also heavily glycosylated. So HIV has all those effects on uh, the antibody response targeting its envelope. And, and so far, we have not been able to solve all those different biological problems with the same product. And in addition to that, it's a... a virus that people can't really clear with their own natural immunity. And as Dr. Fauci has said many times, that's not a good sign for vaccine development. If, if you cannot clear a virus with natural immunity, it means a vaccine immunity may be hard to achieve. And uh, in this case, when you also need very effective T cells that can be easily escaped by this uh, HIV, uh, it has figured out ways to um, infect our main cell for immune induction, the CD4 T cell. And it's figured out a way to evade most of our important uh, adaptive responses like antibodies and CD8 T cells. So it is just a fundamentally different biological problem. And, and hopefully as we learn more about each of these other simpler viruses, we can take all that and apply it back together against HIV and eventually have a solution, but it is, it is really uh, not easy. Yeah. Okay. The next question. What type of vaccine strategy is more efficient against the new variants? For example, mRNA, adenovirus based subunit and the inactivated virus. Right. Uh, so these new variants are coming up. It's not that unexpected. It's an RNA virus. It's a large RNA virus. And even though it's um, got a editing function in its polymerase, it still makes a lot of uh, mistakes during replication. So the more it grows, the more it spreads, the more chances it's going to have to adapt and change and evade uh, both our innate and our adaptive immune responses. Um, not to mention learn how to, uh, to attach or infect better. So, you know, uh, we need to try to keep it from replicating so much so we don't have so many things to solve. But, you know, we do have approaches now that we think can work. Uh, it depends on how quickly you change, uh, change, change course. The, the mRNA uh, is faster to make. The vector-based approaches are probably second fastest to make. And then making stable cell lines or making new uh, vectors for a baculovirus uh, are probably the third fastest to make. And just like uh, you see the rollout happening, I mean, this is all based on how easy it is it to synthesize and manufacture. So uh, depending on uh, how, how you start and how you decide when you have to change vaccines, if you do have to, 
to adapt to these different variants. Um, you know, I think that's the order of how fast it can go. And uh, it's, it's obviously uh, something we could easily switch to. It's just, it would make a delay in the final manufacturing and it creates a real dilemma for the regulators, I think, because, you know, if you uh, put a new spike protein in uh, with nine amino acid changes in its two, 1208 amino acid ectodomain, is that enough uh, change to, to require a whole new set of regulatory decisions? Or is that something you can say, you know, in this setting, uh, we have to just switch uh, sequences and keep going. That That's going to put a lot of strain on the regulatory uh, apparatus, and I uh, appreciate that. But, um, yeah, it would be interesting for me to know and hear what your plans are for that uh, kind of decision-making. Yeah, this is where I wish we were, were live and could um, dig into that discussion because it's a fascinating a fascinating thing. Um, and what can we do from regulatory mechanisms to move things faster? Um, and in the CAS community, we do have people who, um, it could be a fabulous discussion. Um, so, uh, however, we are a little bit limited here, both in time, and I did want to get to a couple more of the questions that are coming in. Um, Let's see. Okay, this one is from Johan. Can different sequences from different variants be combined in one vaccine to reduce risk of escape mutations? Uh, that could be done. I think one of the questions that faces us uh, as uh, vaccine developers is, um, you know, when you would make the decision to change the antigen, uh, you know, because you want the new antigen to also be able to protect the old viruses, because not everyone's getting infected with the new strains. There's not very much of the South African or Brazilian variant yet in the U.S. So you don't want to make that strain and then have it not ad address the, the former viruses. And so some of those studies are being done now, and you've probably seen a lot of things have been posted on bioarchives over the last few days, uh, showing whether the vaccine sera can still neutralize uh, the viruses or pseudoviruses with these new sequences in them. You know, some sequences are more dangerous than others. Some, some sequences, I, in my opinion, the 501 sequence is more about better affinity between the RBD and the receptor, and so it may be for better uh, ability to in, attach or infect. Uh, some sequences may truly be immune escape, like the 484 uh, E to K uh, variant is the thing I think we're most concerned about in that regard, because some of the more potent neutralizing antibodies recognize around that one amino acid. And so I think as long as we have, uh, you know, vaccines that have a lot of antigenic content that are inducing antibodies to a lot of surfaces and parts of the different spike proteins that we have a chance of uh, having immune responses that can resist uh, evasion or escape. And so the question is just, you know, when when is there too much uh, change to, to uh, and that forces you to change vaccines? I, I don't think we're there yet, but uh, we may get there over the course of the next few years. Yeah, lots of future challenges for all of us um, as we continue to move through this. And I think with that, Dr. Graham, we are out of time. Um, it was so great to have you here. Um, thanks for joining us. And um, thanks really for all that you've done. Um, Getting this vaccine out there, it means the world to, to me and my family, and um, very much appreciate all that work. So thank you. Thank you. And I've, I work in a very special place with a lot of very special people. So this has been a really amazing global effort to get this done this year. Great. 
Well, with that, I believe we are headed into a break before the next session. Thank you, everybody.